Thank you very much, Melotin, for giving me the floor. I will um, have the pleasure to talk a little bit about our work on assessing forest disturbance dynamics and drivers using radar satellite data. I will focus a lot on the work related to this project. Um, but before I start, I would like to actually thank Liz for the great introduction and actually demonstrating how satellite-based forest information is used to create impact. On one side, to empower people on the ground with timely and actionable information to actually follow up on illegal and unsustainable forest activities and to intervene them, but on the other side also to stimulate the public debate by making data openly um, available and with this also putting pressure, for example, on multinationals. I will mostly focus on the technical part of this work today. Um, and I would like to acknowledge Robert, who is also in the audience, Robert Masolele, who do, does a lot of work in this project and also many other colleagues from Wageningen University. So I will talk about two things a little bit in this talk. One is about some work on forest disturbance dynamics and then some, a, a second part on, on drivers. Um, we're having a strong focus in, in exploring radar data. Um, the difference with optical data is optical sensors, they record the reflection of the sunlight. In terms of forest, that's the top part of the canopy, and they're sensitive to biophysical parameters, such as the LAI. Uh, radar, in contrast, has much longer wavelengths, so it penetrates into the forest canopy, and the signal is more related to structure, um, which is an advantage when monitoring forests. And the go-to sensor is, at the moment, Sentinel-1, which is an amazing um, mission, which for the first time now, since almost 10 years, provides us dense and high spatial resolution data free and openly. And depending on where you are in the world, we have observations every two days in Europe and in the tropics between six and 12 days. When now processing that kind of radar data um, in, in, in a good, good manner, we can even see very fine scale disturbances. Here we see like logging roads developing over time and in the direct surroundings we see the, the signal of, of uh, canopy gaps due to selective logging and what we actually see here in this, these dark areas for people that know that's radar shadow. On the other side you see a bit of uh, direct scattering and, and layover but what we actually see is a loss of the three-dimensional structure of the canopy which in reality is a gap. So that's actually what we're seeing. We're actually seeing a physical gap of the of the canopy. And we have automized that and operationalized that work and I'm, I'm also happy that, that Liz showed some of these animations to develop the RAD alerts which is a Sentinel-1 based operational forest disturbance alert for the, for the Pantropics and we provide weekly updates that are distributed via Global Forest Watch but are also available in, in Earth Engine and other platforms. The Borneo Atlas, for example, initiative in Indonesia uses it and others. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the aim is really to support law enforcement and transparency. Uh, what I also would like to emphasize, we're doing a lot of work with other groups like University of Maryland that developed some of the key optical openly available alerts to really emphasize that they are not competing, they are very complementary, those data sets. And we did a lot of work recently on integrating those data sets and showing how they can be used in combination to even improve uh, our ability to track changes in, in time. Uh, we have also invested um, quite some effort in, in open source tools. So the backbone of the RAD alerts is really um, the pre-processing of Sentinel-1 data. Um, that's probably 60-70% of the work and then the algorithm is relatively simple. Uh, it's maybe 20-30%. So what we did is we provided an, an open Google of Engine package to pre-process Sentinel-1 data in, in Google of Engine to an analysis ready level. And we have actually seen that that was really a, a lot of uptake in the community. I think there was a hundred or more 150, 170 pub, uh, references over the last one and a half years since we, we published that. We also released an alert integration package that actually allows any users to integrate um, available alerts or their own alerts in, in Google Earth Engine to, for, for, to replicate the integrated alerts available at Global Forest Watch, but also to, to uh, make their own choices in rules. But, um, and this is also now used by a few people. And um, there has, af after we introduced the RAD alerts, 
a number of countries have approached us also in the work we are doing together with Silver Carbon, where we go to countries, we talk to them, we have a number of workshops about capacities and what countries actually need when it comes to alerting. And one of the big requirements, and that is very well understood, is that a lot of countries also would like to, to do in-house processing and process their own alerts for several reasons, for ownerships and all kinds of reasons. So we made the step and actually implemented the core method in CPAL together with the with uh, FAO, and that is now also used, for example, by, by Mexico to produce their own alerts. And I'm very happy that within this project, we are also together, that is mainly done by, by NP and also by Rolf with, with Open Geohub to implement a version in SITS with the overall aim to um, help NP to actually use Sentinel-1 based alerting f as part of their, their near real time um, suit of, of, of products. Um, we are moving from the tropics to Europe. That is work where a PhD student, Sietze, has done some research on the sensitivity of Sentinel-1 in, in temperate forests. So the tropics are relatively easy, at least the, the um, primary tropics. We don't have seasonality. It's dense forest cover. We deal with relatively simple changes, but in Europe it's a little bit different. What he has shown is also the strong effect with, such a stud with this study on, of radar layer of shadow and also emphasized that you actually have to very accurately combine different polarizations and different orbits to make the most out of the Sentinel data. Another aspect in Europe and going to the north is, for example, one aspect So we deal with all kinds of issues here is freezing conditions, so people that haven't maybe worked with radar data, radars interacting with water molecules mainly, um, but once they freeze, they are basically transparent and the signal very much drops. Well, so what we actually see here is not a time series of any change, it's just a normal time series of, of uh, pine forest in northern Sweden and where we see the higher signal is a little bit, is the, what do I have? Yeah, this is basically the summer months and then suddenly things drop. And that is just when the temperature goes below zero and then we also have all kinds of spikes. So we see that it's not so easy anymore to see changes. And here actually, in reality, here is actually a real disturbance event here at the end. So this makes it much harder to automatically process this data. But we've done some major method updates to integrate a seasonal model for phenology, to also consider frozen conditions, also trot conditions. We integrated radar texture and considered all EU forest types to um, provide, the plan is to provide an EU wide coverage by early 2025. And that is part of this project. So it's one of the monitor and where Global Forest Watch is, is a key user. Another user is JRC, and together with them, we would like to explore the opportunity for some local areas in Europe to also integrate it with the Sentinel 2 based effort of, of JRC. Uh, something I'm very excited about is our recent work on monitoring logging roads and selective logging. So, selective logging, if done sustainable, is actually uh, one of the or it's actually one of the most sustainable ways in, in re to respond to the global timber demand. So on the other side, you have clear cutting, basically. But the issue is that a lot of illegality and unsustainable activities are related to, to um, logging operations. And therefore, a wide range of organizations are obviously interested in tracking, tracking that. Uh, what we see here is a planet image from 2020. We see here one from 2021, where we see some logging roads appearing, and we see a year later that we see the signal here, very, not very strong signal, the signal here already disappeared because of rapid canopy overgrowth, and what we actually see here is the rut and the clutter alert. So before I also showed an example where we were able to track with the rut alerts, logging roads and selective logging very well, that works in quite some regions, in particular if the roads are white, but if we go into landscapes where it's more difficult, so where logging roads tend to be much smaller, um, it's much harder. So that's the combination between the key alert systems, and that's actually in it when we add the annual 
um, Landsat-based loss from Madhens, and so that's the information we have available now. And we were able to actually go to something like that now, where we have very accurate logging road information um, mapped, and we did it with a CNN based on Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. We actually map logging roads monthly, and then vectorize the data, so all the data is available as, as vectors. And here's an example how we are now able, because we do it monthly to track that over time, those logging road developments. Um, what we also did is to overlay the new logging road data with old hand digitized data to study, to start studying the amount of reopened roads. That is important because obviously reopening road has a lower impact on the forest than constructing a new road, but it also helps us to start actually studying, okay, what was the time between the initial open, between the initial construction of the road and the reopening? Because that tells us something about also about the sustainability of that logging concession. Because depending on where we are in the tropics, um, to do a sustainable operations, we should leave the forest between 20 and 30 years um, before we before we harvest again. And what we found, so we did that across the whole Congo basin. This data set is openly available. Uh, I don't know why this is not animated. There should be some text. Um, so the data is openly available. What we found, we track, roughly tracked 45,000 kilometers of roads. We found that about 20% is reopened and 20 are in intact landscapes. So I invite everyone to access the data, to play with it. I think it's a fantastic data set. Of course, we also and many others have that wish to kind of trying to relate that remote sensing signal and maybe with the radar signal there's even a higher hope and I also again like this graph that Liz showed, you know, where there's a lot of enthusiasm and then we kind of face reality where we try to relate that remote sensing signal directly to logging intensity, so the amount of roundwood that is extracted from the forest. But that is very hard, and we see some studies that show good correlations if we aggregate very well, but what we in fact relate is not the logging intensity, but the logging impact. Because the impact is actually what we see from space, so the canopy gaps, and depending on how sustainable logging operations are executed, uh, executed that can vary very, very much. So if you have a forester that is very skilled, for example, and he cuts a tree and he makes sure the tree falls in between the other big trees, he doesn't damage them. So it's only a small canopy gap for a big tree. If there is just next to it a concession, they do it very quickly, they have unexperienced loggers, and the tree kind of takes another three, days down, three trees down, the canopy gap is much bigger. But that's something we see from space, while the amount of roundwood that has been extracted from, con from the concession is actually the same. So what we see here is actually because at the large aggregation levels we have some correlations is that we actually think that it's more related also to infrastructure that we see, to roads. And that's doing, actually studying that now, studying, studying that together with, with our colleagues from the Nature Conservancy, we see that where we simply relate the road length in concessions to the harvest volume that is extracted. And we see a quite, a, starting to see quite a good correlation already. So that is some first tests we have done. We have started studying that now. So the second part, it's a shorter part, it's monitoring drivers. Um, we have heard a lot of, about the importance of monitoring drivers, and traditionally that has mainly been done in, in, in assessments, sample-based assessment, where um, the distribution of direct drivers was assessed, and that was done mostly monotemporal or periodical at a relatively low spatial resolution, so either at only sample locations. So one of the famous examples of this is the Curtis data set, which at a 10 kilometer resolution mapped like five different direct drivers. But we think with the availability of AI and these very dense and high spatial resolution data sets, we can actually make the step to from assessment, from mono and temporal or periodical assessments to actually monitoring efforts, where we map things wall to wall. At an annual level or even going towards near real time. There is a set of drivers that we can immediately detect in near real time, which is, for example, small agriculture, mining, roads, selective logging, some of the natural causes like meandering rivers. But there's also a full set of, in particular, if we think about commodities, that we will not immediately 
be able to label because it takes some time after the forest has disappeared, was cut until the crops are planted and grow and we can from space actually see which kind of crop we are looking at. So we work on, on both ends and one end is also work from a PhD, Bart Schlachter, who um, actually disaggregated uh, disturbance alerts into key direct driver that we can map immediately. And um, that was a study on like three geographies that, were, that worked very well in, in Africa and South America, where we can see that we nicely can map like roads, selective logging, mining, and small agriculture. And we are now um, on the way of adding some natural classes and actually operationalizing that effort to provide such information in addition to the location and timing of alerts to also provide a driver because we believe that will make this near real time forest loss information even more actionable because it will allow people on the ground to prioritize where to follow up because if for example you have a concession that you monitor and logging is allowed but then suddenly you see a mining event this is something you would like to follow up but otherwise, there's a big problem with these alerts that people feel overwhelmed about the sheer amount of small events that, that pop up and then they don't know what to do about it. So we really hope that that will support this. Um, on the other side, we have all the new EU policies and maybe EODR coming in and there's really a need to have a better understanding about the distribution and dynamics of commodities and other follow-up land use. And here's amazing work by Robert who has actually disaggregated the Hansen data into um, a large list of commodities for the African continent using deep learning and planet data. Um, this was also the work started in this project, but I also want to emphasize that we had a, if it comes to openness, we had a lot of discussion with the planet team and the upper planet management, and we didn't manage to release this data CC by, because with planet, every product that where planet is used, any derivative, even though it was just used in the model and you can't reproduce the data, you will not be able to release that open source. So it will always be with a planet license, either with a campus license or the NICFI license. So what we're doing in, within this project, Robot now improved a model and actually went to a location-based deep learning model that uses Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, so free data, to make that data set actually really openly available. And we have to start mapping the pantropics, so we finished South America. We are now busy with um, reprocessing Africa and Southeast Asia. And we also, or Robert, that's really worked by Robert, who added also additional classes like maize and soy and sugar. Within this project, we're actually using this data set um, as input for the World Carbon Emission Monitor, which is another task. And in this monitor, we also use ground data from another work package, biomass data, to actually uh, derive emission factors. And this, all this comes together in, in this monitor. And the model itself, the deep learning model, is used to as a key open AO use case in this project, in, in work package three, where um, the user-defined function functionality is, is advanced to actually allow to run a deep learning model on a European backend. So we're trying to actually run that model on, on the Copernicus data space ecosystem. And um, this is also something we're very excited about. And I would like to invite you to um, come to, these, to the workshop from Robert, who will, together with Camilo, explain more about that pantropical um, mapping and also the integration um, with, with emission work and on Friday Robert will present on, on mapping cocoa farms across the pentropics. Two summary slides. I hoped I could show that the high spatial temporal, the high spatial and temporal detail of radar data really improves our ability to assess fine scale disturbances such as selective logging but also to improve the link with ground data. So we are very much decreasing the gap between the resolution of remote sensing data, the crowd and field data, which wasn't possible in the past, where we dealt with like one kilometer modus pixels and forest um, ecologists, for example, they had a few fields, field plots, which was very hard to integrate. But now we are really moving towards something where we much better can integrate it. And also something that I'm really excited about is the upcoming availability of multi-frequency radar data. So not just C-band radar, but also L-band 
data from NYSA and PIP and data from biomass, which um, will really improve our, our ability to assess biomass and vegetation structure dynamics. And that is work we are also doing, but I, I focused on, on other aspects. Thank you very much.